the feedback I got early on was uh, I was too intense. I was condescending. Um, <laughs> I was too sarcastic. Um, I remember sitting in a meeting with my CFO and uh, a group of others. And um, at the end of it, she said, Dan, can you hold back um, for a second? And uh, everybody else left the room. And she said, what is going on with you? You look like you were going to jump across this table and strangle that guy. And I said, Christy, I, I, I literally didn't feel even like a heart rate increase during that meeting. And she said, it was frightening. Huh. Like, I felt like I needed to call that conversation or you were going to hurt somebody. <laughs> How can you help CEOs transition out of the business, project calm in a time of crisis, draw on beating cancer twice as you navigate the challenges of executive leadership? Today, we are joined on The Abstract by a guest who I've had, wanted to have on for quite a while, Dan Haley. He's the general counsel of Guild, which is unlocking opportunity for America's workforce through education, skilling, and career mobility. Dan has extensive experience as a corporate leader, including previously serving as the general counsel of Sprinkler, where he led their $3.7 billion IPO and as the Chief Legal and Administrative Officer of Athena Health. Before going in-house, he was a partner at McDermott, Will, and Emory, and he also had a prior career in politics here and there between law firms, including as treasurer to Charlie Baker's campaign for governor in a number of roles in Governor Mitt Romney's office. He's a Massachusetts boy, uh, if you haven't figured that out yet, and at the RNC. Dan, thanks so much for joining me today for this episode of The Abstract. Tyler, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Yeah. Um, I want to start with something cool that you do every year. Uh, We're going to talk about cool. that. <laughs> you bike across Massachusetts to raise money yeah. for cancer research. Uh, tell us about what that race is and why you do it. Yeah. So first off, it's a ride, not a race, which um, ride, need okay. to be reminded of that in the moment. Um, but <laughs> the, the Pan Massachusetts Challenge is um, very honestly, no hyperbole here, the largest and most successful athletic fundraiser in the history of the planet of humankind. It's, uh, it raises, well, just, uh, for, for perspective this year, um, the Pan Mass will raise $75 uh, million for, um, research and care at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And of course, wow. research and care at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute benefits people all over the world. It's not a, it's not a local thing. Um, and this year we'll cross the $1 billion raised threshold in the lifetime of the event. So it's a, it's a massive, massive undertaking. And, and more importantly, it's incredibly inspirational because every one of the roughly 6,000 riders has a story. And um, it's generally a story about uh, adversity and overcoming it um, or about loss and making the best of it, turning it into something good. Um, and so, yeah, I've, this, is, this will be my 12th year um, consecutive riding since, since my second bout. Um, with cancer. And uh, it's the best thing I do all year, hands down, um, on any number of vectors. How did you decide to do it for the first time? What what inspired you and what made you think I can do that? Because yeah. how big is Massachusetts? I mean, this has got to be like in the hundreds of miles. It's, a, it's just yeah. about 200 miles over two months. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the story is actually quite simple. Um, I've had testicular cancer twice. Um, insert any number of jokes. Um, it makes me a comfortable <laughs> bike rider for one thing. Um, but after the second time, um, which, you know, the odds of getting it, uh, independently recurring, um, 10 years in between are very, very low. Um, <laughs> my oncologist looked at me and he said, look, um, cancer is not going to kill you because we're going to keep checking you for the rest of your life. And if cancer comes back somewhere, somewhere in your body, we'll find it early and we'll kill it. Um, but because you've had cancer twice uh, over the course of a decade, plus um, you've been irradiated so many times with the various tests, scans, and treatments um, in you mm -hmm. know this in the torso area, that um, he said, Dan, you're at materially higher risk than the general population for both heart and lung disease. And he said, the good news mm -hmm. is uh, there's a very straightforward way to 
even out those odds and get back to, you know, parity. And that is get yourself in really good cardiovascular shape and stay there. So Uh, I had a young daughter and, um, you know, there's no motivation in the world. Like I want to be there. Um, yeah. So, you know, he was right. That's a straightforward thing. And at the time I was about 40 pounds overweight. Um, I didn't lead a terribly healthy lifestyle. Um, (laughs) you know, I, I went to the gym and pushed them around and told myself I was doing something. Um, (laughs) <laughs> but I, I, uh, had a friend who kind of suggested that we do the pan mass. Um, and it was, I think 11 weeks out from my surgery. And, uh, so I asked my surgeon, can I do this? And he said, don't do anything stupid, but yeah, <laughs> went on a bike and started riding and told myself, um, you know, after I experienced that, that ride across the state with, you know, people like literally you don't ride a hundred. Well, that's fake. You don't ride 300 yards without passing somebody at the end of their driveway, cheering with a sign that says, thank you. That says, I had cancer, mm-hmm. my kid had cancer, or, you know, sometimes you see a little kid, um, you know, without their hair or standing at the end of the driveway with a sign that says, I'm mm-hmm. a patient of Dana Farber. And it's just mind blowing. It feels so good. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say about that is this year for the first time, um, my, my team is, um, riding uh with a pedal partner which means uh we're riding for a little boy who's currently undergoing treatment for pediatric leukemia um his name's jackson wow Um, he has a twin brother named henry who's healthy um and that experience uh kind of seeing what that family is going through um it just is a wonderful perspective exercise tyler it's um Mm -hmm. you know it's trite to say you know very few challenges in the workplace are life or death um, no shell, mm-hmm. none ever in the workplace is like having a four-year-old child fighting leukemia, um, right. and seeing the way this family approaches that and the grace and the courage, um, and this little boy who just, that's just his life. He's powering through, mm-hmm. he's doing the kid's stuff. He's got a great prognosis, but it's a year long slog. Um, and that just, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, I think about having had cancer every day. I don't, not even close, probably not even every week, maybe not even every (laughs) month anymore. Um, And by the way, my challenges with cancer were a tiny fraction of what Jackson's challenges are. It shouldn't even be the same word. It's kind of embarrassing to me that what he and his family are going through is, you know, same broad label as what I went through. Um, But both are perspective setters and it makes it easier to tackle things at work with, um, some perspective and some equanimity, I think. When is the race this year and how can people support it oh, if they want thank to? You for saying that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that very much. Uh, it's the first weekend in August always is. And, um, you just, uh, Google PMC rider look up and search for Dan Haley and my page will come up. One of the coolest things about the pan mass, many cool things is it's entirely volunteer supported. So there's no overhead zero. So literally every Mm -hmm. single cent of every single contribution goes directly to Dana-Farber and the research and care there, period, full stop. So it's it's the most efficient use of charitable dollars that you can find anywhere in the world. That's I mean, it it is that's an incredible number. I did not know that it was, you know, a billion dollars or seventy five million dollars a year. I mean, that like that's like 75 nonprofits put together sometimes. Right. So it's a massive percentage. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, it's a massive percentage of Dana Farber's operating budget. And I can tell you firsthand experience, one of the weird benefits of having had the same cancer a decade apart twice uh-huh. is my treatment. The second time around bore very little resemblance to my treatment the first time around. And that is a direct result of the research that happened in that intervening decade and the improvements in care that happened in that intervening decade. Jackson has Hmm. a great prognosis. A little boy 15 years ago with uh, Jackson's cancer would have been dealing with a very different reality. Um, And that is a direct result of um, the donations. So it's really, it's really a cool cause. Can can I ask you before we we move on from this, um, do you have folks, because you were probably in relatively stressful jobs with high expectations associated with them while you were navigating 
these diagnoses and treatment? And do you have folks who come to you and ask for advice about how do I keep like all these balls in the air between my family and my high powered job, which is a good thing. And now having to deal with this sort of significant health event what do you what do you tell folks when they come to you and ask for support or advice? It's hard to answer this question without sounding self aggrandizing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the first time I had cancer, I was uh, in my last year of law school, and it was literally my treatments. My surgery was right before finals, and then my treatments were all through studying for the bar. And I was working part time oh. at Goodwin Proctor at the time, so my day was I get up in the morning, I would go to Goodwin Proctor. I would work for half the day. I would go to my bar review class and I would go to um, Brigham and Women's Hospital, get my radiation, go home, usually throw up and then study for the bar. And, um, that sounds. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> it was just, you know, it was not optional. I mean, I suppose. Right. That's not totally true. I could have said, like, I'm going to put off the bar a year and I'm going to do all these things. But didn't occur to me at the time. And so in the file of silver linings. That experience did give me the ability ever after to say, well, this thing I'm going through is not that six week long period. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm not throwing up involuntarily while I study for the bar. So, you know, you kind of get through. Um, Right. And I don't know, like you can't, you can't visit the alternate reality, you know, where I can't visit the alternate reality where I didn't go through that. So I don't know Mm -hmm. how much of my work ethic or whatever stems from that. I suspect a pretty good chunk of it. And so to circle back to your actual question, yes, people ask me that. Um, It often comes up in the context of, I do um, endurance events sometimes to stay in good cardiovascular health. And um, Mm -hmm. so I've done a couple of Ironman triathlons and that requires you to get up at like three in the morning to do the training. And how do you work that into your work schedule? And, you know, gosh, I'm too busy. You know, you must... And uh, I always say, actually, I'm probably at my best when I'm training for something like that because it orders the <laughs> mind. It creates, uh, you know, um, the imperative to like actually use your time deliberately, and that goes for mm-hmm. family time and and social time and all that too. Um, and having a goal is just having a goal, having an ostentatious goal is really yeah. a tremendously motivating thing beyond just the goal itself. That mm-hmm. your question. It does. Yeah. People see you as a sort of like Zen lawyer and, and happy lawyer, I think, uh, both within the broader GC community, but I probably also the folks who, who you work with on a day to day basis. Um, I think this does follow from what we've what we've been talking about. Yeah. Was that an evolution? Was that was that something that, you know, you stepped out of law school and you beat testicular cancer for the first time and you passed the bar and everyone saw you as zen and happy or yeah. or you know, how how have you drawn on this variety of experiences and gotten feedback from others and and sort of reached that place over the years? So, uh, I think the true answer to that question, Tyler, is yes and no. Um, so first of all, there's <laughs> like, you know, the stuff that applies to everyone, you, how you're brought up and all those things. And I, I get a lot of my personality from my dad. And I think that was from, you know, jump street. He's, he's a happy guy, <laughs> everybody like a friend. And that's just how I always saw him approach his employees and, and, uh, his coworkers and, um, you know, the waiter at the restaurant, whatever, um, so there, mm-hmm. There's that. Um, but in terms of the like the Zen thing, which cracks me up. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, that was a major evolution. And I've frequently said so. The first person who said that to me was my CEO at Sprinkler, uh, Raji Thomas. He shortly into our time together introduced me to a group of people as Dan's the most Zen lawyer I've ever worked with. And I just <laughs> laughed and my God, I want to call my first CEO, Jonathan Bush from Athena Health. <laughs> tell him what you just said, because Jonathan would not have recognized that. And I owe Jonathan um, for that tremendously. I, I can remember um, as I think about what started that evolution, I got a lot of feedback when Jonathan did me the huge favor of making me a general counsel for the first time. Publicly traded mm-hmm. company. I had no business being general counsel of a publicly traded company. I was running govern- government affairs for Athena Health at the time. Um, and mm-hmm. We're seeing litigation. But Jonathan and I clicked and he took a bet on me. And the feedback I got early on was uh, I had I was too intense. I was condescending. 
Uh, <laughs> I was too sarcastic. Um, I remember sitting in a meeting with my CFO and uh, a group of others. And um, at the end of it, she said, Dan, can you hold back um, for a second? And uh, everybody else left the room. And she said, what is going on with you? You look like you were going to jump across this table and strangle that guy. And I said, <laughs> I, 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 I literally didn't feel even like a heart rate increase during that meeting. And she said, it was frightening. Huh. Like, I felt like I needed to call that conversation or you were going to hurt somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just kind of mind blowing to me. Um, and then Jonathan gave me this tremendous gift. He said, Dan, I want you to practice the ancient art of equanimity. <laughs> and that's been my watchword ever since. When I start feeling myself get a little heated or whatever, I think equanimity. <laughs> um, and I think about all those life experiences and perspectives and, and, you know, remind myself nobody's dying. And uh, so, yeah, I yeah. like huge evolution. I find it is a tremendous compliment when people tell me things like you're the calmest lawyer I've ever dealt with. You're the friendliest, <laughs> you know, all mm -hmm. these things. And, and this is important. I recently got um, feedback in a 360 that suggests to me, maybe I've taken that too far. <laughs> some feedback that said, you know, sometimes people worry that my lack of emotion around things that they believe are very important hmm. is signaling that I don't believe they're very important. And, Interesting. And that's also hugely helpful feedback. And by the way, it's, um, you know, just another of a uh, big pile of evidence in my own career that seeking people's frank and honest feedback periodically is a huge gift and everyone should. Mm -hmm. um, but that gave me a lot to think about. I thought like, okay, telling everybody all the time, nobody's dying. Mm -hmm. Hit people as patronizing, condescending, dismissive. Like, right. you got to be careful. You got to be mindful. I mean, there's two sort of interesting lessons about feedback in there, actually. One is being able to receive it and yeah. think... Uh, okay, I'm not going to be fired just because the CFO or the CEO is telling me they think I can improve in this way, shape, or form. Sure. The other is is when you're in that position as the CEO or the CFO being willing to pull... I mean, as the CEO, I suppose, right? Like every member of the exec team reports to you. But CFO, right? Like you got to peer on the exec team and being willing to be honest and candid with that person and tell them something you're not going to make an enemy out of them. Right. Not necessarily always easy. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if there's a question in there. It's just more of an observation. <laughs> well, I couldn't agree more. And frankly, um, it's my belief that if you're an executive or frankly, if you just have a manager uh, and mm -hmm. your boss never gives you constructive feedback, you ought to be a mm -hmm. lot more worried than if he or she gives you a lot of it. Because if you mm -hmm. a lot of it, that means that person is invested in helping you identify your gaps and improve. Um, if they're right. just, no, you're great. You're great. You're great. Maybe yeah. you are. Maybe it's the case that you just, you know, you've got no opportunities for improvement, but that would make you a singularly unique human being. How do you keep that sort of positive attitude and... I guess an, another sort of follow on question there is, do you think that's important internally, right? Like, do you think that legal or the general counsel or I know you've run HR before, do you think that, you know, you as the GC play an important role in setting, we'll call it sort of the tone for the business and how people interact with each other? So the answer to your question is yes. And um, I'm always very mindful of just the truth that my approach is my approach and it works for me and it's worked for the companies where um, I've had the privilege to be general counsel and other companies have different cultures, other executive mm -hmm. teams and CEOs have different approaches. Some companies very much want the GC to be the hard ass in the room, very much want sure. the GC showing up with, you know, the pocket square and the pinstripe suit um, and the, uh, the serious demeanor. Um, that's, what their business needs. That's what their culture demands. Cool. Great. I will never be mm -hmm. that person for anyone. <laughs> um, I mean, frankly, I think probably relatively few companies really want what I bring, but when I find <laughs> one, it's a wonderful fit. Um, yeah. and I'll, I'll tell a quick, quick story on that. Um, the way I got to sprinkler was, uh, after leaving Athena health, I had the, the, 
real gift of um, being able, because of the package I got from Athena, to um, spend a summer just traveling with my family. And that was wonderful. I wasn't being particularly deliberate about my search. And um, mm-hmm. I got a message that the CHRO at uh, Sprinkler would like to talk to me. And I looked at this company and I thought, oh, marketing technology, that's not anything I'm interested in. New York City based. I'm a Boston boy. Uh, <laughs> that's not interesting. But you know, if somebody wants to talk to me, that's a gift. And I'll certainly talk to this person. And this woman named Diane Adams, who is um, a force of nature and became one of my best friends in the world. Um, she appeared on the screen and I was wearing a dumb novelty t-shirt uh, because I couldn't even be bothered to change clothes. <laughs> so unseriously was I taking it. Um, and she came up. Thank you for wearing a nice polo shirt for this episode. This is a struggle for me, actually, Tyler. I'll tell you why if you want to know. Um, but uh, Diane came on screen, and, and the first thing she said was, you're wearing a funny T-shirt. I think we found our guy. <laughs> and I laughed and said, tell me a little bit about that. And she said, um, well, excuse my French, but we've been looking um, for a year and a half for a uh, GC who isn't a tight ass and you've already <laughs> communicated to me that that's you. And I just like that interaction threw a switch for me. I said, you yeah. know, I engaged with the conversation and never really looked back and had a wonderful um, three and a half year run with Sprinkler. Um, and we, we went public and um, I, I've got to, I've got to um, take issue with the way you described that. You said I led the IPO and I want to be super clear. Um, he, he doesn't lead an IPO. <laughs> Um, and any GC who said they let an IPO is, is being self aggrandizing. Um, fair enough. I, I managed the legal <laughs> side of the IPO and it was a wonderful experience. I, the GC certainly can be a part of that. Um, some CEOs don't want legal anywhere near their culture. Um, I've mm-hmm. had the tremendous privilege of being in three companies where I had an opportunity to play a cultural leadership role, even to the point where, um, I've got a, a s- small file of my favorite professional compliments I've ever gotten. Um, and right up there at the top is Jonathan Bush at Athena saying to me, um, I cannot believe I want my lawyer to take over my culture functions, but really <laughs> run HR and professional development and recruitment. And um, that was awesome. Uh, that was an incredible experience mm-hmm. um, and an incredible compliment. Um, but that's a choice. That's, you know, I have always been at companies where my inclinations fit the desire. And that is we want our, for lack of a better term, control functions to be approachable and mm-hmm. leading and friendly um, and um, not soft, not, you know, not, not doing a double negative, still really yeah. doing all of the things that those functions exist to do, but doing them in ways um, where, people feel like you're, you know, partnering with them and looking out for their best interest and not the, you know, the lawyer walks in the room and everybody clams up because, you know, here's the lawyer. Right. And also, I mean, just b- building on that, that thought, um, the business that wants the, the GC in the pinstripe suit with the pocket square and who's very serious and potentially aggressive. And I mean, that's a reflection also of the CEO probably and the way that they run the business. And you know, I mean, different personalities attract different personalities. Uh, and that, you know, that's a good thing. Um, talk to me a little bit about, cause I want to, I want to talk through, I don't know if we're going to call this crisis management, but, um, want to talk through some of the CEO transitions that you've helped manage. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you keep that demeanor in times of crisis before I ask you about sort of some specific situations. So the only answer to your question is deliberately. Uh, Hmm. It's something that you have to work on and be conscious of. And I think one of the things that lawyers in general and GCs specifically need to always keep in mind is there's a certain authority invested in the credential that is not necessarily um, Hmm. uh, present for all members of the executive team. Mm We'll instinctively look to the lawyer in certain situations as a gauge of how worried should we be about this thing? How serious is this? Is this a big deal? Is this manageable? Um, And even if you don't have any better insight into the answers to that question than anyone else around the proverbial table, 
people are going mm-hmm. to look to you and take their cues from you. And so mm-hmm. that is, even when you feel um, internally, that inclination to like jump to conclusions, rush to worst case scenarios, you have a responsibility not to do that. And one of the kind of tricks I use, tricks, tools I use for myself and also I impose it on others is asking the question, what do we actually know to be true? Hmm. And what are we assuming? And then how Mm -hmm. do we test the assumptions? What conclusions do we draw from what we know to be true? It's almost always the case in a crisis, especially early on, that the things you know to be true, know to be true, not assume are true. Mm -hmm know to be true, very small set of things. Mm -hmm. People tend to pile assumptions into that first category. Know this to be true. So I assume this is, this is true. And I'm going to just act on them as though they're, you know, they they have equal weight. I've done this before, uh, which you are saying is resonating. (laughs) I mean, every, everyone does it. Um, but, and, and it's very hard this is where the the kind of inherent authority of the GC can be very helpful because you can say to a CEO who wants to react, um, mm-hmm. and CEOs always want to react. No one wants to be caught flat-footed. Nobody wants to be criticized by their board a week into a crisis for not taking immediate and deliberate action. So the action impulse is always present. So mm-hmm. the danger at the front end of a crisis of doing things that make it worse Um, is very, very high. And I found Mm -hmm. that tool, what do we know to be true? It's very useful. And then the second part of it is how do we increase that pile of things as quickly as possible so that when we get to a point where we have to make a decision, where there's a binary, we have to do this or we have to do that. We have to ignore this. We have to address it. Left, right. You want that pile of known things, true things to be as big as possible uh, Mm -hmm. when you're making that um, decision. And it does tend to scratch the CEO's itch at the outset to say, here are the things we are doing to learn as much as possible, because that is action. That's not, that's right. not being passive. The Abstract is brought to you by SpotDraft, an end-to-end contract lifecycle management system that helps high-performing legal teams become 10 times more efficient. If you spend hours every week drafting and reviewing contracts, worrying about being blindsided by renewals, or if you just want to streamline your contracting processes, SpotDraft is the right solution for you. From creating and managing templates and workflows, to tracking approvals, e-signing, and reporting via an AI-powered repository, SpotDraft helps you in every stage of your contracting. And because it should work where you work, it integrates with all the tools your business already uses. SpotDraft is the key that unlocks the potential of your legal team. Make your contracting easier today at SpotDraft.com. So you're at Athena. I want to ask you about a couple of different situations where you've had to project calm in difficult times, um, both of which have to do with, for different reasons, transitioning a CEO sort of out of the business or to a different part of the business. Um, You're at Athena. You've had a great run. You have a great relationship with the CEO, Jonathan Bush, uh, and a hedge fund called, we can describe him as a hedge fund, I suppose, an activist investor called Elliott Management comes in and uh, the business is public and they buy up a bunch of shares and um, they have different designs for the business. (laughs) Why don't you tell us what happened in in your own words and what you can say also uh, and then I've got a couple questions for you about sort of how you managed the, the situation. Yeah. Well, in the event anybody's listening to this uh, comes out of it wanting to know more about um, the Elliott engagement with Athena Health, uh, there's a long form New Yorker article about hmm. this, this period of Athena's history, um, about the head of um, Elliott Management, a guy named Paul Singer. And the title mm-hmm. of that article is Paul Singer Doomsday Investor which gives you a flavor <laughs> of um, kind of the initial proposition when Elliot got in our stock. Athena Health uh, is a um, health information technology company, so in healthcare. And uh, Jonathan Bush always used to say um, in talking about health uh, information and information flow in healthcare that, you know, anything you Google, you know, I've got this spot on my arm, you Google it, what does it mean? And 
Google will tell you you're going to die. Um, <laughs> when you Google, Google Elliott Management, what you hear is, oh, you're really screwed. They will, they will get what they want from you. It's only a matter of time. Uh, their tactics will get uh, gradually more um, aggressive. Uh, in certain mm-hmm. given, so you might as well just give in. And so that was kind of the basic proposition when we found out Elliot was in our stock. The way you find out is um, you get a phone call from um, somebody at Elliot Management, in this case, mm-hmm. Jesse Cohn, who's pretty notorious, very affable guy, um, really friendly. <laughs> I could actually see myself being friends with him and we had a good in- interactions, but also just stone cold killer. Um, and, uh, and he, he says, uh, you know, hi, I'm, I'm Jesse. I'm calling for one of your new investors. And um, we've, we've got a whatever percent stake in your stock. And we've got some ideas. We'd like to meet with your board. And that kicked off an 18 month long saga that um, I always hesitate to say this because I assume people are going to think I'm full of it, but I'm not. And I mean it. Um, <laughs> that came twice. And that was the hardest 18 months of my life. Um, those wow. two things are not even close in terms of the stress they caused, the emotion they caused. Um, that is just a true statement. It's also true that um, I wouldn't trade that 18 months of my professional life and development uh, for anything. Um, I learned more in that 18 months than I have in any comparable period of time in my life. Um, I also wouldn't go through it again willingly if I can help it. Sure. <laughs> but uh you know, in terms of the crisis management stuff, um, that is a really unique situation because in a public company in particular, most of it is secret. And even the fact of Elliot being in our stock um, for a period of time was highly confidential. And so Mm -hmm. the CEO, the board, the GC is dealing with kind of existential stuff. Um, And nobody else knows. And um, it is all encompassing, but you've got to keep doing your job as though nothing's happening. And, and right. you know, the CEO's still got to do the interviews and the town halls and the, you know, all the ordinary course stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And you have to do it in a way that others around you don't pick up something really serious is happening. Um, mm-hmm. And so yeah, one of the anecdotes, I know I've told you this before, Tyler, um, I thought I was doing a great job at that. You know, I was really proud of myself. And uh, and my chief of staff came into my office um, a couple of weeks into this and said, you have got to stop running around. You're stressing everybody out. And I said, <laughs> well, what do you mean? And Athena at the time existed on a beautiful kind of bucolic campus. And so we had a whole bunch of buildings mm-hmm. spread out across this area in Watertown, Massachusetts. And um, I was so crazy busy that I was literally running from meeting to meeting and that was uh-huh. stressing people out. So I was, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, in my mind, I was, Hey, good morning. How are you doing? How are the kids? Blah, blah, blah. And I thought I looked, you know, normal and I looked right. manic. <laughs> crazy person running from meeting to meeting, like smiling like a lunatic. Um, good lesson. You know, it's, yeah. it's not just the kind of top level body language and, and, demeanor mm-hmm. and all that. People read, people see when you behave differently. Um, yep. So the reason I said it stressed me out to wear this shirt, I had a little crisis. If I show up <laughs> on a, a Zoom it, at work in this shirt, oh. people immediately, are you interviewing? What's going on? Right. <laughs> people notice things. It's, uh, yeah. they draw conclusions. That's interesting. How did you help facilitate or transition Jonathan Bush, the CEO, out of the business? Um, Because that, I'm sure, was maybe, if not the most difficult part of the process or dealings with Elliot, certainly one of, I would guess, the top three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So the the New York article, uh, New Yorker article, uh, is really, that's what it's about. It's about the whole cycle of that process. And, um, And I would say... So that was by far the hardest part of it. Um, I owe Jonathan Bush not everything in my career, but um, more than anyone else, I owe Jonathan mm-hmm. the, the bet he took on me. Um, he was and is a friend, and I love him. And um, that was Elliot got in the stock with the basic theory that 
this founder CEO has taken this company as far as he can, and we need uh, the company needs operational leadership and sure. executive chair and all those things. And it was an 18 month long period to get there. And the tactics that Elliot deployed straight out of a movie, like anything yeah. you can think of, nothing beyond um, nothing beyond parody or caricature, um, just brutal stuff. And uh, ultimately, the correct business decision that the board and Jonathan came to was uh, in order for the company to move forward, Jonathan needed to step aside. And I would say I did not manage that process. I did play a role um, in managing and mediating the very complex intersection of corporate governance, human relationships and human emotion. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was very, very difficult. Another kind of thing I have in my head in terms of pivotal career moments was a a walk I took with the then lead outside director of the board. Um, He asked me to go for a walk on the campus at Athena. And uh, he said, the board and I have talked and we think we should bring in um, outside independent counsel to advise the board um, on this situation. I said, okay, can I ask a few questions? And he said, of course. And I said, do you have concerns about my ability to advise the board in this situation? He said, no, it has nothing to do with your ability. Um, we are, we're, we don't think it puts you in a fair situation between the board and Jonathan. You're very close right. to Jonathan. And um, we don't feel that uh, you'll be able to effectively um, balance those things. And I said, well, do me a favor. And if your concern is you need more expert advice or your concern Mm -hmm. is my capacity to give you the substantive guidance, then absolutely. It's your prerogative to retain outside counsel. That's a very ordinary thing. If you're doing it to protect me from a hard situation, then please don't do that. Uh, Hmm. I view it as my job. I think uh, as soon as you bring in outside counsel, things will escalate. Uh, Mm -hmm. outside counsel, one of the profound differences between inside counsel and outside counsel is outside counsel will always give the worst case scenario advice. Always. Right. (laughs) Every possible eventuality. And so there is a natural and inevitable escalating effect to bringing outside counsel into a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. And that dynamic was already so fraught. Founder, CEO, high intensity, high charisma, cult of personality within the company, board full of people with very close interpersonal relationships, both between and among themselves and with the CEO, and this apex predator investor (laughs) um, that, you know, the notion of introducing another accelerant to that dynamic was very Mm -hmm. me. And the board went off and discussed and had me come say basically the same thing to the board that I'd said to Brandon Um, and they ultimately decided not to do that. And I think Hmm. that was to the company's benefit. Actually, I, I believe strongly that was to the company's benefit and Mm -hmm. set me up for that 18 month period. That was hand to God, the hardest thing I've ever dealt with in my life. So, you know, trade-offs. Let's just be clear about something. Uh, you've also done a lot of amazing work and had a lot of good times at the companies that you've been at, yeah. <laughs> uh, Athena, Sprinkler, and and now Guild. Yeah. Um, but cool. you know, drawing on or, or building on the same sort of theme, different scenario. Um, but you end up at Guild and and you're working there, and unfortunately, or you know, sort of tragically, um, the the founder CEO has a stroke. Mm-hmm. And uh, ultimately has to sort of make a decision to, to step back from the founder CEO role and, and become the chairman of the business or, or transition to full time being the chairman of the business. Um, am I missing anything in, in that sort of setup or, or maybe, you know, tell, tell us the story of what happened there from, from your perspective. And then I, I guess I want to, I want to hear, you know, sort of your, your lessons, right? Oh. You, you've been through this once now you're going through it again, yeah. <laughs> uh, in a different situation, Yeah, you know? Yeah. T- tell us about what happened. Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, Rachel Romer, the, uh, founder, um, and former CEO of Guild is the most courageous person I've ever known in my life. Um, and the way she is dealing with, um, the uh, challenge of having had a very serious stroke at age 34. 
while, while <laughs> sitting on top of the world, while um, single mom to two young children, two young daughters, um, just mind blowing the way she's come back from a very, very significant health setback um, mm -hmm. and the way she's engaged both with the business and with her recovery and her children. Um, it's mind blowing. And, um, and again, it's another one of those perspective things. Um, you know, we all have challenges and some people's challenges are much more significant than what, you know, we allow ourselves to get stressed out about uh, sure. a given day. It's always a challenging thing to transition a uh, founder CEO in a successful company. Um, it mm -hmm. tends to be um, in many ways culturally synonymous with the company. Uh, yeah. People, you know, equate both publicly and internally the company with the founder CEO. Um, and so it feels existential um, when that person is no longer there. Um, mm -hmm. Sidebar, it's also, um, both my experiences have been good um, evidence for the proposition that no one is irreplaceable. Um, hmm. Yeah. And we should all remind ourselves of that when we start feeling like, you know, <laughs> we're the center of the universe and <laughs> our involvement. But in both situations, the human considerations were much more significant and important than the company considerations, I would argue. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an important thing, I think, for any GC managing a similar situation to bear in mind. That is, I think, true in its own right. And it is absolutely true for the protagonist in the situation who is the founder CEO. Mm -hmm. um, it is very easy the press release at the end of the process always says the same thing. It's very <laughs> anodyne and it's very, it's not fake because everything's true. Mm -hmm. um, but it is not even a Cliff Notes version. Uh, and it doesn't have anything to do with the human proposition of individual founder CEO stepping away from something that he or she built from the ground up with blood, sweat, tears, and often, you know, personal investment, both financial and emotional and family and all those things. Mm -hmm. Anybody who um, underplays the importance of that for the individual uh, is missing the story. Um, mm -hmm. And anyone who pretends like, oh, that's just a consideration that you can just, you know, jump over, get by, do the right thing for the business, you know, all those things. Not, yeah. Um, you have to balance those things and get to a point, which we did in both situations, where um, the founder CEO is making a decision that he and she knew, as heart wrenching as it was, uh, was best for them individually and best for the business, um, mm -hmm. best for the employees, best for the investors, best for the end users. Um, but that is that is a hard puzzle to put together. Uh, yeah. It has the blocking and tackling of the governance stuff. What's the right process? Which mm -hmm. documents do we have to amend in which way at what time and all those things, they're important. And if you let yourself get unnecessarily pedantic, uh, if you let yourself um, elevate those things over the human considerations, Mm -hmm. um, you're doing a bad job and you're going to hurt your credibility and you're going to get marginalized. You have to work those things into the overall tapestry of what's going on. And they're really very small number of threads within that overall tapestry. Are there things, maybe my, my last sort of question on this topic, are there, are there things that you did differently at Guild with the benefit of having experienced not an entirely analogous situation, but a somewhat similar problem set at Athena. Yeah. Um, well, I think it, it comes back to perspective. Um, there are very different, different situations, but very s similar in core and important ways. It was an external factor that kind of forced. The issue. Mm -hmm. It was also true in both companies that um, there was a need for, more focused operational leadership um, that, you know, in mm -hmm. the case of Athena, that was a core part of Elliot's kind of proposition, which, by the way, I should have said at the beginning, 
Elliot is a big bad bear, but they're very smart and they come with mm-hmm. data and insight that, you know, it's like, it's like they're showing you a mirror that can see inside you and it's wild. You know, I've looked <laughs> in the mirror a thousand times and never seen what they're seeing. Um, so there was- and I think, by the way, that uh, whatever the guy's name is, the description of, of him as a stone cold killer, he would probably take that as a compliment. Absolutely. Without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Without, I mean, he'd probably think it was understated. Um, but uh, and, and in the case of Guild, um, you know, there are huge benefits to um, visionary founder leadership. And at a certain point in a company's life cycle, there is a need for a perspective at or near the top that is less about passion and vision and more about nuts and bolts. And it, mm-hmm. we were very, very fortunate to have um, within our executive team, a woman named Beagle Shaw, who over the course of her time at Guild had performed a number of executive roles. Um, at the time of Rachel's stroke, she was at the tail end of her maternity leave. And um, Rachel tells the story and her family tells the same story of, you know, Rachel, when she woke up, the first thing she said was somebody called Beagel. Put Beagle. Really? Um, and now Beagle is our CEO and she is fantastic. Huh. Um, we are extremely fortunate to have been able to navigate that handoff within, you know, a situation that could have caused chaos. Uh, it didn't in large part because Beagle knew the business so well and was able to step in. Um, and uh, the board had a tremendous amount of confidence in her, um, went through all the correct steps um, to make that transition official over time. But, um, you know, we were, we were very, very lucky. Athena, it was more rocky. It was, there wasn't someone who was, mm-hmm. you know, obvious and, um, available. And Athena at the board ended up bringing in an outside CEO, a guy named Bob Siegert, who's very, um, operational. He was a PE guy and mm-hmm. CEO, and they've been very successful in the years since. Um, but a very different form of leadership, very different form of transition. This has been such an interesting conversation, and I really appreciate your willingness to to tell these stories and and talk about them in a in a candid way. Before we wrap up, I've got a couple of sort of fun. I think they're fun. Traditional closing questions that I like to ask sure. guests. Sure. The first is if you've got a book that you've read recently or that's been instrumental in your career that you want to recommend to our our audience. Yeah, I usually fumble around when people ask me that question and today I'm not going to <laughs> because I've got a very present tense answer to the question. Um, InfoSec reports to me at um, Guild and, and did as well at, at Sprinkler. Um and my, my uh, head of InfoSec um, asked me to read a book called The Phoenix Project, which is, <laughs> it's a novel, uh, but it's also um, the genesis of what in the tech community is called the DevOps revolution. It's a way of doing um, product development within a technology company, a framework and a set of methodologies that is now tremendously widespread. And it has its genesis in this um, novel called The Phoenix Project about an auto mar- out- automotive parts manufacturer, manufacturer and how they transitioned from legacy IT to a new way of doing things that blah, 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 revolutionary, revolutionary yeah. business. And that sounds so uninteresting. And when she, <laughs> when she laid that out for me, I was like, uh-huh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely put it on the list. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and then I was I was riding my bike and listening to a podcast, and uh, my my data stream got um, futzy or something went wrong with Apple Podcasts or something, and it stopped working. And I stopped, and I was aggravated. And I just I looked in Audible um, audiobooks, and I looked up the Phoenix Project. And I was like, I I should give this at least a few minutes, and I'll I'll listen to it on you know two times speed and whatever. <laughs> and I started listening to this thing, and um, you know. Four days later, I finished it, having listened to it at every opportunity. Um, it's funny. I mean, it's like it's not a particularly com- like the characters are very cardboard. There's their corporate stereotype, <laughs> uh, tight ass chief compliance officer who gets in the way of everything and then has an evolution. And you've got the demanding CEO who just doesn't understand what the IT folks do, and it, it, it's cardboard. But for anyone who's worked in the bowels of a tech company. There are so many Mm -hmm. things that resonate and I just kept having moments of, oh, I didn't understand that or minor things like, oh, that's what that acronym means or, you know, that's what that 
terminology. That's, you know, when people yeah. me all the time and I just let it futz right through my head. And so I've now, for the first time in my career, committed the sin of saying to my whole team, I'm going to require you to read this book and we're going to have a conversation <laughs> about it next month. Um, it drives me crazy when like people do that. Like, I love this book and now you must read it. I'm requiring it. <laughs> God, that's annoying. And I'm doing it because it gave me insight into tremendous insight into how a very crucial portion of our business and frankly, any modern business works mm -hmm. that if you haven't been inside of it, you don't understand it and understanding it will help me be a better GC for my business and will help my team give better advice, be better collaborators, be more mm -hmm. proactive. Um, I'm, I've got a high degree of confidence around the notion that uh, people will, if not thank me, at least <laughs> it wasn't a waste of their time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, long, long answer to a short question, Tyler. It's almost, a, it almost sounds like a language guide uh, or, yeah. or a mental map for how folks yeah. on the technical exactly. side are the thinking about what they do. Yes. Yeah. And the brilliance of it is there's just enough true narrative drama to keep you engaged if you're not in that world. Interesting. Yeah. Another one to add to the list. There you go. <laughs> Uh, my last question for you, Dan, something that I like to ask all of our, all of our guests, um, that's, you know, if you could look back on your days as a young lawyer, maybe a good one, something that you wish you knew back then that, you know, now. Yeah. Um, I got a lot of answers to that question and I'll just pick one. And again, it's present tense bias, um, conversation I had recently with my team. Maybe this is self-evident Tyler, but the things you learn in law school and the things you learn are important to being a good lawyer at a law firm, you have mm -hmm. to, in many ways, unlearn to be an effective inside lawyer. Hmm. Um, so just a couple of examples, citations, footnotes, memoranda, <laughs> case, and then unpack the analysis and then write your conclusion, kill yourself. In, a, <laughs> in an inside counsel role. I mean, kill your professional reputation. Yeah. Um, I remember very uh, shortly after leaving Athena, talking to one of my colleagues on the executive team and he there, and he said, um, Dan, I never read a single email you wrote. <laughs> and I, I was like, what? Are you kidding? And he said, no, I, I would get them and I would do a flick. And like, let it scroll and see how long it was. And it would be way too long. And I would put it in the <laughs> file to read later. And never would. And I, was like, God, I wish you had told me that at the time. Tremendously great input. Like, right. And I use that with my team all the time. They send me things. And I say, who do you expect to read this? Mm -hmm. Who is your audience? Right. There is no one within our four virtual walls who is going to take the time to read this thing. Mm -hmm. Go into our repository of guild e debris and be forever forgotten. <laughs> How many hours did you spend writing it? What was the objective? And almost always it was answer a question. And how long is the answer to that question? A sentence? A paragraph, maybe? Certainly not 10 pages. Yep. <laughs> Um, and then the other element of that that I always think of is uh, we talked about a little bit earlier, the uh, worst case scenario advice. Mm -hmm. the, well, you should be aware that this highly attenuated, extraordinarily infinitesimally unlikely <laughs> thing could, in a certain sense, uh, set of very unlikely circumstances happen. Sure. And all people hear from that when it's delivered by the lawyer is, oh, shit, <laughs> this thing could happen. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to, you know, do everything possible to. My favorite example of that was, um, my favorite recent example of that was when the Silicon Valley Bank collapse happened. Sure. Um, early on, you know, it was over a weekend, and law firms all spun up online panel discussions and generated white papers and everything else. And somebody said early on, you know, corporate officers and directors could face criminal liability for failure to meet payroll. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. It was everywhere. It was headlines. It was, you know, every board of directors was calling their lawyers saying, I could be criminal liable. How do we garbage? There was no <laughs> scenario 
behind <laughs> any law enforcement arm was going to hold someone criminally liable because their bank failed and they couldn't get their money. Right. No chance. Zero. Less than zero. But everybody was losing their minds because somebody at a law firm mm -hmm. found that there was a path to get there and said it out loud and everybody lost their minds. That happens all the yeah. time. Absolutely. If you liked this uh, or you want to learn more, I guess, about the, the SVB crisis and, and what some companies did, uh, I will plug later in the season, I'm going to be talking to the general counsel of Rippling, Vanessa Wu, who's fantastic, uh, who managed to close a huge financing round over the course of a weekend in the middle of the SVB crisis. So that way Rippling could backstop all of their clients' payrolls. Um, but Dan's exactly right. Uh, you need to meet your payroll because it's the right thing to do for your employees. Yes. And if you don't pay your employees, uh, they're going to lose faith in you and will go and find another job. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, but probably not because there's going to be an enterprising prosecutor who comes after you. <laughs> okay. Not about you. <laughs> yeah. This has been a fantastic conversation, Dan. Uh, I've been wanting to do this for a while. Thank you so much for, really for coming it. on and, and joining me for this episode of The Abstract. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah. This is great. And to, uh, to all of our listeners, thanks so much for tuning in. And we hope to see you next time. Oh.